Hi, my name is Drew and today I'm going to be walking you through the Revolve EV3 by Palomino. We're going to start right up front here with the loading and unloading procedure. Uh, what you have uh, at the very front of this A-frame is going to be your coupler. Uh, it is equipped with a slide latch here. Uh, as that latch sits, it is in the unlocked position. It is ready for that uh, loading. So what you're going to do is raise the jack three inches above your ball and drop, setting yourself underneath the coupler. Uh, of course, retract that jack back down on top of your ball. Once fully seated on that ball, we're going to go ahead and slide your latch lock forward. So uh, what we're looking for is these two teeth on either side of the uh, latch to be fully resting within the frame there. Uh, now, not a bad idea to go back and pin with a secondary pin here, whether that's a locking pin or just a spring pin. Uh, what that does is that is a secondary safety uh, device that will keep this from rattling potentially uh, loose going down the road. Uh, from there, we're going to take our toe chains. We are going to cross those underneath the coupler. Uh, we're going to cross those underneath the coupler and hook those onto the receiver of the vehicle. Uh, it is state law in Texas that these chains do need to be crossed. Uh, also, it is, it is illegal in the state of Texas for those to make contact with the pavement at any time. So uh, make sure you are skating that line of having enough room to make your turns left or right, but not so much room that they could potentially make contact with the ground causing ground sparks. Uh, riding right next to your tow chains is going to be your emergency breakaway cable. Uh, this is very important. So this is essentially your last line of defense. Uh, if your coupler here were to fail, uh, as well as your tow chains, as the two vehicles separate, this is going to act like a rip cord to the electric brake system. Once that pin is pulled, you're going to have full uh, 12 volts going back to the electric brakes, uh, essentially avoiding a runaway trailer scenario. So uh, it is very important that we do connect this to the receiver of the vehicle with its own separate connection point. So whether that's a carabiner or a quick link, uh, either way, uh, you do again want a separate or third connection on the receiver for your emergency breakaway. Uh, we also have your seven-way receptacle here. Uh, this is going to plug, uh, your seven-way plug I should say, is going to plug into the seven-way receptacle on your vehicle. This is going to give you full function to your tow vehicle's braking system, uh, charging system, marker lights, tail lights, things like that. Uh, hopping right up here to the operation of the jack. Uh, as you see, we have a light there that's going to not only light your way if you are uh, doing any, any loading or unloading after dark, also going to give you a point of reference again if you are backing up to the unit uh, when it is dark. Uh, it does have an easy on-off switch there, very straightforward. And then here you can see here clearly marked on the momentary switch, uh, extend and retract for um, the jack there. Uh, if we focus here on this rubber plug on the top, uh, if you were to go ahead and remove that plug, that's going to expose a three-quarter inch drive nut. That's going to be your manual operation for the jack in the event that you do have a power loss situation of some sort. You can still, uh, again, load that and unload that unit in an emergency. Uh, coming right back here, now, we have this interstate deep cycle battery in that kind of traditional location where you would um, see a battery on a camper. Uh, now, a couple things to point out. Now, this battery, uh, with the Revolve here, they're doing th things uh, quite a bit different than what you typically see. Uh, this is, of course, an all-electric unit. There's no propane gas. Uh, it is equipped with a 3,000-watt inverter with four lithium batteries, uh, a ton of solar there on the roof. So uh, there are going to be some things with this unit that are non-traditional uh, as to what you would generally see. Uh, one of them is the way that they operate uh, with this battery up front. So this battery is standalone. What it's going to do is it's going to uh, essentially be wired to the uh, electric tongue jack here. Uh, and it is also going to control that uh, emergency braking system and things like that because they do need a constant 12 volt um, to those to work properly. So uh, keep that in mind. So when you're going down the road utilizing your your charge line with the vehicle, the only battery that that is maintaining is going to be this battery up here, which again, the functionality of this battery is very limited. Now, if you want to, um, you know, charge that, uh, li that lithium with your vehicle uh, or, or, you know, you're, you're in a situation where you're not uh, able to, to top off those batteries with any conventional method, the solar or anything like that, uh, you have this large plug here on the A-frame. So uh, the idea being is that if you truly do get in a bind, uh, you can go ahead and make this connection here 
uh, on the frame, uh, just like so. And then you would take this long, very long cord and you'd run this up to the engine bay of your v tow vehicle, uh, hook this onto uh, your battery post, excuse me. And then what you could do is you could run your vehicle and, and essentially charge that lithium directly off of the, um, the tow vehicle. So it's a little, it's a little different than, than anything that I, even I have seen before. Uh, but there is, there, it is capable to do all the traditional things that you, you would again find uh, in a, you know, a normal, uh, regular kind of camper setup. So uh, moving on here, uh, one thing that I do, do want to kind of back up and, and mention, now this is a lead acid battery. It does carry some, some maintenance with you to keep that in tip top shape. Uh, what you're going to go ahead and do is you're going to pull these vent panels up a couple times a year uh, and refill with distilled water as necessary. So there is a clear marked water line. Uh, within those battery cells and we do just want to go ahead and maintain that. So uh, what we have here is going to be your six gallon water heater. Uh, this is of course a 110 volt appliance. Uh, manufacturer has a couple recommendations when it does come to maintaining the unit. Uh, number one is going to be if the unit is going to be in storage for more than seven days, it is very important that we do go ahead and drain the unit separate of the rest of the fresh water system. And they also recommend that before returning the unit back to service that we do go ahead and prime or pump six gallons of water uh, into the unit before we start heating it. So uh, when it comes to draining the water heater, uh, of course, first up is we're going to turn the unit off. We're going to do that with this toggle switch right here. Uh, once that toggle switch is in the off position, we're going to give it a couple hours to go ahead and cool down. Uh, you know, once you are uh, confident of the temperature, we're then going to go ahead and depressurize it. So what we're going to do when we depressurize it is we're going to cut the overall inflow of water to the unit as a whole. Uh, so if we're running on city water connection, we're going to go ahead and uh, either turn that water off at the valve or physically disconnect the hose from this location. If we are running on potable water, we're going to go ahead and turn off that 12 volt water pump. Uh, from there, we're going to go to the hot side of any fixture within the unit, whether that's an outside shower, whether that's in the kitchen, the bathroom, either way, we're going to turn that hot side of the fixture on uh, and we're going to let the excess pressure within the unit bleed off from that location. So once we've done so, uh, we are safe to go ahead and drain it. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to come here with an inch and an eighth socket and extension and we're going to go ahead and back this drain plug out. Uh, once we've done so, we're going to see the remaining, you know, five, five and a half gallons of water uh, evacuate from this location directly. Uh, once we've done that, we are, we are of course ready for storage. Uh, now when it does come to returning the unit back to service, uh, we're then going to replace this anode rod, uh, make sure that we do uh, make a nice firm connection there. Uh, from there, we're again going to go to the hot side of, of any fixture. Uh, of course, once we've, we have an inflow of water to the unit, uh, we're going to go to the, the, uh, any internal fixture again. We're going to turn that hot side of that fixture on. Uh, we're going to see a little something a little bit different this time. So we're going to see uh, that flow is going to be airy. It's going to be very bubbly, spitty. Uh, what it's doing is it is working the, the air or displacing the air from the tank here and refilling it with water. So uh, once that flow normalizes at the fixture, that is our indicator that we are full here and we can go ahead and start heating water. And we're going to do so by uh, flipping that switch into the on position. Uh, so from here on out, I've referenced this as a drain plug and it is, it is truly, a, it truly is a drain plug, uh, but it does kind of pull double duty. So it is actually an anode rod as well. Uh, what an anode rod does is it acts like a magnet for hard water deposits, calcification, things like that. They deposit onto the anode rod uh, and they eat away at that as opposed to the inside of the water heater. Now this is a consumable part. I would expect to get a year or two out of, uh, a year or two of service out of an anode rod before needing to replace it. So just keep that in mind. Uh, it is going to start out about three quarters of an inch by 12 inch. Uh, by the time it needs to be replaced, it's going to be about the size of a pencil and look very decrepit. So keep that in mind. Uh, moving on here, uh, we have your water connections. These have already previously been referenced, but we're going to go more in depth here. Uh, up top here, we have your potable water fill. That's how we're going to fill that onboard holding tank. We're going to stick our drinking water hose directly in. We're going to fill it up to it overflows. Once it overflows, we go ahead and cap it off. Uh, just a reminder, you do need to use that onboard 12 volt water pump to draw that water up from the tank uh, to the fixture to make it usable. 
Now below that we have your city water connection. This is what we're going to use if we're in the capacity of an RV park or we have access to full time running water. We're going to go ahead and use this guy here. Water pressure becomes very important when we do talk about city water connection. Generally these units are rated for a uh, water pressure rating of uh, 50 to uh, 75 PSI. Uh, it's very important that we do not exceed those levels. So what we're going to do is we include a water pressure regulator with your purchase. This is going to keep this, that water pressure within those levels. So this hooks directly onto the water source and then your hose hooks onto that. And then ultimately we make our trailer connection here by rotating that trailer uh, bound connection. Now it is very important that you always use a water pressure regulator. Uh, I would not recommend using the units for any amount of time without a, a water pressure regulator. Now if we go ahead and drop down, we got uh, quite a bit going on down here. So uh, we're going to start with the, the freshwater holding tank. Uh, go ahead and if that's been in use, we're going to go ahead and drain that. We're going to go ahead and hop over to these low point drains there. We're going to open those up, make sure we're draining everything, uh, all of the in-between plumbing, everything between water source and fixture here. Lastly, we're going to finish up with the water heater uh, following the procedure that was previously outlined. Once we've done all three of those things, this unit is 100% empty of water or 95% empty of water. It is ready, percent, uh, ready for storage uh, for an indefinite amount of time, uh, not taking into account any winterization that may need to be done, uh, but it is good to go uh, you know, from a safety standpoint storing. So uh, dropping down here to the stabilizer jacks, uh, you have stabilizer jacks on all four corners of the unit. Uh, now these are to stabilize the unit, they are not for leveling. Uh, if we're raising the unit, if we are leveling the unit front to back, we're going to use that main tongue jack up front. Leveling from left to right is going to be done with the tires and a leveling kit. Uh, once we are level, we're going to go ahead and run these jacks down. So you have again a three quarter inch drive nut. You're going to come down, make contact with the pavement, maybe a quarter turn more just to shore everything up. Same on the way up. Don't have to go uh, overly tight in either direction with these. Uh, that is going to keep these stabilizer jacks in, in better shape longer uh, if you get in the habit of using a light touch. Uh, hopping up here to talk about the Schwintech system and maintaining it. Uh, this, this slide out uh, utilizes that Schwintech system. What that means for you is you have a track on the bottom here as well as on the top and both sides of the slide. So it is very important that we get on a 90 day maintenance schedule with these slide out components. Uh, what that's going to entail for you is, uh, again, once every 90 days, we are going to lubricate these tracks. To do so, we're going to use a PTFE dry silicone lubricant. Uh, generally comes in an aerosol can. We're going to go ahead and spray those down. Uh, we are then going to run that slide in and out a couple times to distribute any lubricant. Uh, and we're good for the next 90 days. So also on that same schedule, we're going to want to condition these seals here. Uh, we're going to want to keep those rubber seals nice and supple. So we're going to use an RV grade seal conditioner to do so. Uh, keep in mind that these slides do wrap fully around the slide out as well as you do have a set of seals that you can see here on the exterior of the unit. You also have a, a, a matching set of seals on the interior of the unit because that slide does seal in both directions. Uh, making sure we are conditioning both sets of seals. Uh, moving on here, we have your uh, tire pressure and lug nuts. So uh, lug nuts here, they've been torqued to 100 foot-pounds here in the shop. Manufacturer recommends a retorque procedure. What that's going to entail for you is a first 15, 25, 50, and 100 miles of initial travel. They want you to go ahead and stop at those intervals and make sure those lug nuts are maintaining that level of torque. Uh, manufacturer further recommends that at the start of each trip there on after that we do go ahead and check that torque again, making sure that they are maintaining that 100 foot pounds of torque. Uh, also, uh, very, very important that you keep the tire pressure at the correct uh, level. Uh, with any trailer tire, you run them at the max. Uh, you can find that tire pressure stamped on the tire in its more traditional location. Uh, or if you come up here, uh, you do have a data tag for those tire and axles, and you can see that that tire pressure is 65 PSI. So that's right where we want to run those tires, whether we're completely empty or completely full in terms of weight, that is going to give us the highest flexibility. So that is the magic number. Uh, moving on further, <clears throat> we have 
Um, you know, storage compartment up front here. Um, it has a light, nice if it gives you a point of reference. Uh, as you can see here, we have your Renogy 3000 watt inverter. Um, not really much that you're gonna need to do with that. It is already set to work in conjunction with the lithium and things like that. Uh, if we step past here, uh, we actually have the remote switch for that. So even though the unit is right here, uh, it is as easy as an on off toggle switch here to turn that on and get that started. Uh, below that, we have your BPU or your battery protection unit. Uh, what that does is that's going to protect those lithiums from being uh, you know, over discharge uh, as well as overcharged. It is essentially just an inline device that is going to uh, make sure that that system stays in tip top shape. Uh, also, this is going to be number one when it does come to kind of unloading the unit uh, to get power to anything other than the tongue jack you do have to open up this compartment and turn this switch on. Uh, to do so, you're just gonna hold that down for a spell. Um, so, of course, I didn't, I didn't hold it down long enough, but you can see we have uh, our lights here. The unit is uh, working correctly. If I were to go ahead and turn it off, everything, you're gonna see everything in the unit go uh, dim down, just like so. So, you truly have access to, to nothing uh, at this point. Everything passes through that BPU uh, to function properly. So again, starting out, first thing you're going to do is you're going to hold down that switch uh, till it powers on and, and, and there you go. So um, something to keep in mind. We also next to that have this battery disconnect switch here. Uh, this is going to isolate those batteries from that 12 volt section. Uh, again, very important that with the, with the amount of lithium we have and the price of lithium, that we do keep those batteries in tip top shape, especially when we're storing the unit for long periods of time. What this switch does is it's a common switch that's gonna isolate those batteries from the system. Uh, and essentially it is designed for periods of long-term storage. Uh, at this point, with it being so easily accessible, anytime I was storing the unit, I would go ahead and flip that switch into the off position. Uh, and you're gonna be good to go with that. So, so very easy, anytime you're storing the unit, just go ahead and turn that unit off. It is essentially a overall switch for the unit that is gonna power everything down, uh, and as well as isolating those batteries from the 12 volt system. Uh, if we drop down here, we have your uh, dump valves here. This is where your gray and black water is going to be dumped. We have gray water here on the left, and we have black water here on the right. Black water is gonna be anything that comes from the toilet, your body waste, things of that nature. Gray water is gonna be anything that comes from the sink or the shower. Uh, it is very important that we do operate this properly from a sanitary standpoint. Uh, we wanna make sure uh, that we, we keep, uh, that, that we do not have any of these, either of these valves open at the same time. Uh, we wanna avoid any back feeding issues, things like that. Uh, with this black water tank or black water valve that needs to maintain, be maintained in the closed position uh, and only opened as necessary when we are dumping. So it is very important that we keep the contents of that black water tank uh, in as wet or flowing condition as we can. Uh, so uh, what this scenario kind of looks like is of course you're going to use the monitor panel on the inside to inspect your levels. Once that black water tank uh, is indicating full, we're going to, of course, make our connection here utilizing our sewage hose. Uh, this sewage hose connects the very same way this cap comes off. You have four uh, studs along the outside of that piping, uh, keyholes on either the sewage hose as well as the uh, lid there. You're going to put those in the halfway position, give it a quarter inch turn to lock it on. Once we've done so, we're going to go ahead and, and route this to our dump receptacle. Uh, once everything is on, in line, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna grab this black water valve and we're gonna pull it six inches towards the rear of the unit. Uh, once we've done so, of course, that, that, that body waste is gonna evacuate that tank and flow throughout the tube. Now, once we, are, um, once we are sure that we have evacuated that tank fully, we're gonna go ahead and close that black water valve. We're then gonna come over here to the gray water and we're gonna dump that at the same time. We're gonna go ahead and open that up. Uh, same process there. Uh, what that does is that allows that gray water, which is the cleaner, of course, of the two waters, uh, two waste waters that we have here, and that's going to rinse uh, any shared plumbing as well as your sewage hose uh, with that gray water. Uh, once we've done so, we're going to go ahead and close that 
uh, gray water valve uh, and the unit is ready to, to you know, be stored or uh, you know, move from one location to the next. Uh, it does, does go without saying that we do not want to carry any body waste unnecessarily going down the road. So we are going to dump before we switch locations, uh, no matter how full that tank is indicating. Uh, moving on um, towards the rear of the unit, um, we have uh, your outside shower here, access to hot and cold water, nothing too exciting there. Uh, does does coil up and is all self kind of self-contained in this unit um, you know nothing too crazy to focus on there uh, we have a, a secondary solar set, set up here so if you wanted to take advantage of a portable unit say you didn't want to park your unit in direct sun you wanted to in turn use a portable solar unit excuse me you can go ahead and make your connections here uh, take that take that unit uh, out into the sun and take advantage of, of solar that way. Uh, we have right next to that going to be your black tank flush. Now that corresponds with a jet inside the black water tank. Uh, what that is designed to do is, specific, is to blast off any compounded toilet waste, body waste, things like that. Uh, it is very important that you operate that correctly. Uh, again, from a sanitary standpoint, uh, there's no check valve within that tank. So it is, it is possible to overflow that tank uh, essentially flooding the unit from the roof line. Uh, man, this specific manufacturer recommends that you do go ahead and keep that black water valve in the uh, open position while utilizing the black tank flush. You're gonna make your connection here. Uh, with that valve in the uh, open position, you're gonna go ahead and, and flush that tank uh, until you're satisfied with the, the, the level of cleanliness. Uh, directly below that, we have a cable satellite inlet there. That's just a standard RG6 cable fitting. Uh, it is a pass-through connection to designated TV areas of the camper. What that is going to allow you to do is feed any uh, aftermarket satellite packages or cable uh, from the unit. Uh, below that, we have your a little light here. What that's going to do is help you uh, light this space here. Uh, if you are making any power connections after dark, uh, and that toggle switch is below the unit. So what you have below that is going to be your power. So this is your cord, comes with the unit. It's 30 foot in length. We're also gonna include with the unit a 30 to 15 amp producer. Uh, say you're somewhere where you may have limited access to a 30 amp outlet. You can go ahead and use this 30 to 15 amp producer to plug that into a standard 15 amp outlet. What that's going to allow you to do is run some low draw appliances, uh, you know, do some, some, you know, maintaining of the batteries, things like that. Uh, of course, this unit is, is designed to be standalone off-grid, uh, so you don't necessarily need to be plugged in uh, to run anything on the unit. So just keep that in mind. So what we have here is going to be your full-size spare tire. Uh, when it does come to changing a tire, we're going to uh, put our jack directly on the axle as close to the tire we're trying to change without it interfering in our work. Uh, and that is going to be sufficient jack location. Um, of course, you can go ahead and, and, and replace um, the blown tire here on this bumper mounted uh, spare tire carrier. Uh, we also do have a, a receiver down here as well. Uh, if we were going to utilize that for some bike racks, cargo rack, of course, you can go ahead and relocate that spare tire anywhere here on that two bumper. Uh, moving on. Uh, here, um, not too terribly much um, going on here on this kind of porch area or this, this uh, side of the unit. We, of course, have your speakers. We'll get to the operation of those there on the inside, as well as the awning, things like that. Uh, take a quick look down low, make sure I'm not missing anything, and I think we're good to, to move on. Uh, a couple 110 volt uh, outlets here, just some all weather outlets. Uh, to power any devices that you may be taking advantage here kind of on this porch space. Uh, standard RV style assist rail uh, is going to, uh, you know, stow in that position going down the road. You're going to want to make sure you fold it. Uh, when you lift up, fold it out, it does lock in that extended position. Um, steps here, uh, entry steps are, are housed here within the entry door as we see here. Uh, they they kind of uh, block that entry door. Uh, so when it does come to, to put those down, you have this blue lever here. 
Uh, all you do is pour, pull that towards the front of the camper. That's going to allow you to come down here with those steps. Uh, as you can see here on the legs of the, or on the, the feet of the steps, we can actually uh, position those wherever we need them um, dependent on the ground grade. Once we're satisfied with the level, we go ahead and put that pin in uh, and we're good to go. Uh, lastly, we have your front storage compartment here. Uh, this is going to, you, you'll have a toggle switch in here that's going to control that blue lighting across the front that we saw in the intro of the video, uh, as well as you have a light uh, inside this compartment uh, that's going to utilize that uh, tap style switch there that is the center of the lens. Um, just about covers it here on the exterior of the unit. We're going to hop on the inside and take a look at those uh, features there on the inside. So here inside the unit, uh, starting right up here up front, um, of course you have some light fixtures here on the underneath of the ca uh, underside of the cabinetry. Uh, we saw how to run those on the outside, which again is just pushing that center button there on the center of the lens. Uh, 110 volt outlets on each side uh, of the Murphy bed, uh, as well as a USB charger on that side. Now this unit utilizes a jackknife sofa. It's very easy to go ahead and make this bed out. If you go ahead and grasp the couch by the very front here and lift up, kind of put your hand here on the rear and help that down. Uh, once that lays flat, you just very easily grab the mattress and flip it over. Uh, very easy, uh, just takes a couple seconds to go ahead and make that bed uh, or stow it away. Uh, also here in this uh, front area, we're going to get an example of both styles of windows uh, throughout the unit. Uh, this one here uh, to the right of me, it's going to be that more standard style window. Uh, does have a crank out here, so you go ahead and, and crank that bad boy out. Um, same on the way in, uh, and and you don't really again you don't have to you don't have to really bear down on these. You're, you're not doing yourselves any favor um, when it's when it's closed. It's closed. So as long as that handle uh, is is parallel there, you're going to be uh, closed. Uh, also, we take a look here at the shades. They do have those projector style shades that, that pull down. Uh, this is just a single stage shade. Um, and, and, and again, very easy to use. If we hop over here to this other window, this is going to be your fire exit. Uh, in the event that your entry door here were to be blocked, uh, you could exit the, uh, the unit from this location. Uh, of course, pulling that screen out of the way, uh, that will allow you to go ahead and open this window uh, fully, it does, it does go fully out like a doggy door. Uh, of course, that position that I opened to it here is going to be if you want to use that for a normal uh, window. So it does have a, it, it, it does kind of pull double duty there. Uh, if we go ahead and, and talk about this fan here. So we have these fans uh, in a couple other places throughout the unit. Uh, very easy. It has a little black button here. If we go ahead and push that button, that will allow us to go ahead and lift up. Now these are exhaust fans. So we have a little button there. Uh, what they are designed to do is, is just kind of get air moving throughout the camper. Uh, if you go ahead and have these windows open, uh, have these vent fans running, what that's going to do is create a nice cross breeze. Uh, when it does come to closing them, we of course turn it off, uh, push that black button again and, and go ahead and pull them down. Uh, stepping over here into the uh, entry door area, uh, quite a bit going on. Uh, we have your GFI outlet here. Um, all of the outlets within the unit are on that same circuit. If one of those units were to get overloaded, uh, this is going to be the reset point for, for all units on board. Beside that, we have a, a uh, light switch there. It is clearly marked uh, in terms of function. So uh, the microwave and the fireplace are on the same circuit. You can use either one at any given time. So this is just to select which one you'd like to use. If you want to use the microwave, of course, flip that switch up. That's going to power on the microwave. If you want to run that fireplace, uh, of course, flip it down. Uh, coming up here, we have your convenience center. This is going to give you a real-time readout of where your tanks sit, as well as your battery and level of full. So battery's full. Uh, battery's going to read full anytime you're plugged into shore power. Uh, fresh water is three quarters full, uh, black water empty, gray water empty. Uh, now this is a pretty generic panel. So some of these units, depending on the floor plan, will have two gray water holding tanks. Uh, however, this unit only has one. So this last option, that gray water two, uh, 
Uh, gray tank two is, is null and void. So go ahead and just focus there on, on that guy there. Uh, we have your water pump switch here. Uh, that is just a on off toggle switch. We can tell it's on by of course the red light there. Uh, living room light switch. So just a common switch. It's going to take uh, care of most of those overhead lights uh, down the center of the unit. Now you can of course, uh, again, they are independently switched. We've talked about that many times already. Uh, you can control which ones come on and off with that main switch. Uh, dropping down here, we have our awning light switch. Um, there is a, a LED light strip on the tube of that awning. Uh, again, that allows you to light that space uh, in the event that you are uh, have that awning out uh, and you want to go ahead and light that space. Uh, slide in and out switch here. As I mentioned previously, this, this unit equips the Schwintec slide out system. Uh, it is very important that we uh, extend that slide fully in the out position and retract it fully on the in position. What we want to avoid is short bursts or partial openings. You do have two independently geared motors that are pushing that slide in and out. Uh, and again, so fully in, fully out, uh, no halfway openings. Uh, that's going to go ahead and keep that, that Schwintec system in tip top shape. Uh, what will happen if you kind of make a habit of, of, of using that incorrectly is it can actually push that slide sideways uh, and get it in a bind and it's not going to go fully, it's not going to go in or out. So keep that in mind. Uh, awning extend and retract there. Uh, a, a one thing to bring up with that uh, is you can't overextend that awning. So if you go ahead and you hit this, you hold this, uh, without watching what you're doing there on the awning, uh, it will overextend and what happens is it reaches that fully extended position and then it starts to kind of roll back in backwards. Uh, and, and you know that you have overextended and then of course rolled it all the way back in backwards uh, if that fabric is sitting underneath that roller tube. Uh, normal operation, that fabric is going to be on top of that roller tube. So just something to keep in mind, something that I have uh, seen uh, in my experience. So what we have here is going to be your Intellitronic system. Uh, that's the built-in energy management system within the unit. Uh, what this does is it allows you to choose priority of your 110 uh, volt appliances to appropriate, appropriately manage their load. Uh, you can not only set precedence over uh, which appliances you want to run uh, in what order. Uh, it also, you know, does learn your habits. It can, it can kind of fine tune that for you. Uh, this is one of those things that, um, you know, no amount of explanation through this video is going to be enough for you. Uh, you're going to need to educate yourself properly on how to use that, how to adjust that. Uh, there is a service manual within the unit. Uh, of course, we can help anywhere along the way. Uh, if that, if that, doesn't kind of clarify things for you, uh, but just so you know, in its base capacity, as it is set up from the manufacturer, uh, you could leave it as is, and it is going to do everything that it needs to do. Uh, moving on, well, not so fast. Uh, we have your fire extinguisher here. One thing we do want to touch on, uh, it is very important that we do test all of our safety equipment uh, before taking the unit out. Uh, fire extinguisher is just as important as any. Uh, we're going to go ahead and push that green tap down if it springs back. Uh, that means we're good to go. If it stays depressed, there's no pressure within the unit. It's not going to work to extinguish any fires uh, and you need to pull it out and replace it. So here we have your Furion display. Uh, this gives you access to CD, DVD, AM, FM radio, Bluetooth, uh, essentially your multimedia uh, center within the unit. So if we're uh, utilizing a CD, DVD, of course, we're going to just put that in the slot there. Uh, we'll feed that directly to the television. Again, if you're, if you're utilizing a DVD, uh, we have zones one and two here. That's a, the speaker zone. Zone one is going to be the interior of the unit. Zone two is going to be the exterior of the unit. Uh, single mode button, and we're going to find that right here on the end. That's going to go ahead and cycle through the modes. So uh, very easy. I find most people can navigate through these uh, very straightforward. You have a Bluetooth pair button there. Um, you know, it looks like your seek and seek buttons there. Uh, very, very basic kind of, you know, car stereo styled unit. So it is very, again, very user friendly, uh, with anything within the unit it does have its own service manual. Uh, if you have any questions, consult that, uh, or feel free to give us a call and help us. Uh, we'll help you clarify that stuff. 
Uh, moving in uh, here to the kitchen area, um, of course your television set here uh, does use a tension mount so that's going to hold its place there against the wall when going down the road. Uh, from there we can go ahead and, and position that throughout the camper. Um, nothing too crazy with that but I do want to pull that out and expose this antenna booster plate there. Uh, on the roof we're going to find a omnidirectional digital over the air television antenna. Uh, that gets its power from this plate here. So for that to be uh, capable of bringing in that over the air programming, that red light needs to be on. Uh, what you do from there is you go ahead and, and run a channel search on the television. It's gonna automatically seek out the best signal. And again, bring any programming, uh, uh, bring any programming in dependent on that signal. Uh, also a couple USBs back behind here on this side. Again, if you do any charging uh, of the USB driven devices, you can do that right here in the kitchen area. Countertop extender, um, roll away, which is nice. Uh, a lot of people like that. Uh, I have to agree with them. Uh, you know, standard fixture here, hot and cold, uh, nice, large, open, single bay sink. Uh, really, really am a, a big fan of this kind of setup. Uh, moving on, we have your Greystone uh, induction uh, unit here. You can see all your controls are right here on the unit. Uh, again, very easy to navigate through. Uh, all of your functions and controls are going to be accessed by right here on the actual unit. Uh, dropping down here, uh, taking the place of what you would, uh, you know, your standard cooktop and uh, propane oven is going to be a uh, convection oven. So this is a three-way convection oven. It is a microwave, it is a convection oven, it is also a grill. So it does have a heating element here up top. Run that thing like a, a toaster oven if you please. Uh, very functional with these two appliances paired together. So this is a much better option than you're gonna standard find in a camper. Uh, it does give you uh, the ability to, to cook just about anything. All right, so what we have here is gonna be your carbon monoxide detector. Uh, very important piece of safety equipment. Uh, does have a test button. Now this particular uh, uh, this particular uh, appliance is wired into the 12 volt section of the camper. So there's no batteries to change. It's unlike the smoke alarm uh, that is going to have a battery to change. Uh, but it does have a test button on it very much like the smoke alarm. So go ahead and hit that test button before taking the unit out. Make sure that that is functioning properly uh, and you'll be good to go. All right, so up next here we got your uh, refrigerator. Uh, now this is a, a 12 volt compressor style refrigerator. Uh, what that means for you uh, is, is just that. So this is going to run off your batteries. These are very efficient. They, they work tremendously well. Uh, you get a lot more space than you typically would with a standard three-way uh, refrigerator. Uh, now what we have in terms of control is going to be here right there on the light. So you have a dial here uh, and it doesn't, it's not very scientific in, um, you know, your settings. You have cool, cold, and coldest. So what you're going to do is experiment, uh, find out what level works for the amount of uh, food you're trying to uh, keep cool. And, and it's going to take a little bit of, of finagle in there. Now, if you have this thing loaded up, uh, it's very important that we go ahead and take this bar and put that there. Uh, what that does is that keeps that weight off, the, you know, from the door to keep that from, from rattling open going down the road. Uh, right above my head here, we have your air conditioner. Uh, controls are on the unit itself. Uh, of course, you have uh, fan speeds here. So we have, we have low fan, we have high fan, low cool, high cool, things like that. Uh, and then we have a thermostat here. Now also on this knob, we'll see we have low heat there. This unit, believe it or not, is equipped with a heat strip. Excuse me, your heat is gonna come from this location as well. So we not only have to turn that uh, to heat, but we do have to rotate this uh, knob here uh, into the red, of course. And if we let that sit for a spell, it'll start producing some noticeable heat. Uh, again, all electric heating here, all electric everything within this unit. Uh, and that's how that is going to be utilized uh, right there on the, the unit itself. Uh, and then moving over here to the sidewall, we have your Renergy charge controller. Uh, that's going to help man manage those uh, solar panels that we have there up on the roof uh, as they intake energy. Uh, this is going to, again, keep those, those uh, lithium batteries from being overcharged. Uh, and, and taking energy as necessary. So 
as a general consumer, there's not very much that you're going to be doing here. Uh, of course, you can uh, read the display here. It is going to give you uh, your level of full voltage, how many amp hours you're taking in via solar, things like that. All of that, all of that information can be uh, accessed here right there on the display. Uh, it does work kind of in the background, so there's not something that you have to actively do as well. Uh, again, it is already set up to do its job and, and will we'll do that uh, without any interference from you. Uh, moving on here, we have your uh, fireplace. Uh, I love these, these little fireplaces they throw in here. They're very classy. Um, this is also an electric heat option as well. Uh, it does have, uh, you know, kind of like a space heater setup. It does produce heat. Uh, you can, of course, turn that heat option on and off. Uh, so if it's in the middle of summer and you still want the, the look of a fireplace, you can still have the lights going and things like that. Controls are up here on top. Uh, they are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, On-off switch, of course, you can dim the brightness there of the lights or change the color. Uh, so they have some really nice colors available there. Uh, this is going to be the brightness of the light. So essentially you can change the color uh, as well as the brightness. And then the last one's going to, of course, you can see this back display here, uh, is just going to control the thermostat uh, or the heat side of things. Uh, and then above my head, we have your nine volt smoke alarm. Uh, we're going to go ahead and access that just like your smoke alarm at home. Uh, you know, it'll alert to you, uh, if it is the presence of, of smoke, uh, it does run on a nine volt battery. Uh, very important that you keep a spare nine volt battery within the unit, uh, in the event that that starts to go, uh, dead in the middle of the night, something like that. You do want to make sure you have a replacement that way. Uh, you don't have to remove the battery, which, which of course we all know is never a good idea. Uh, another max fan here, uh, uh, again, uh, going to function, you know, we saw the functionality of that there on the, uh, you know, above the Murphy bed there. Uh, we have a, another sleeping area here within the dinette. Uh, what you're going to do is this is a pedestal style, uh, you know, dinette setup. So what you would do is you'd wrestle the tabletop, uh, away from the legs. Uh, this is going to break off into three different pieces. So the tabletop is going to separate from the legs. You can go ahead and remove that or, or go ahead and, and, and set that tabletop aside for a few minutes. Uh, then we're going to go ahead and remove the, 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 uh, the pedestals from the flanges on the floor. You're gonna, again going to go ahead and set those to the side for a second. You're going to come back with the tabletop and you're going to go ahead and rest that tabletop here on these black bumpers. And you have those on each side of the dinette. Uh, from there, with that tabletop in place, we're going to go ahead and take these two rear cushions and put those on top of the tabletop, uh, again, effectively creating a, another sleeping space. So, uh, Very cool function, very common with campers to run that pedestal style. Uh, it's kind of that tried and true uh, method. Uh, also, of course, you have the bunk beds back here as well. Um, very straightforward. Uh, each bunk bed has its own light, same style of light we've seen throughout the camper, which is going to be that push button style. Uh, just not easily for me, easy for me to, to get those on camera. Uh, and they also each have their own USB uh, chargers as well. So dual, dual USB chargers on each uh, bed as well. Uh, down low here we have uh, your fuse panel box. Uh, now this is going to house your 110 volt appliances only. Uh, and, and when we were looking or talking about that uh, energy management system, uh, you see the numbers on the, the, you know, the numbers with the LED lights, those directly correspond with the circuit uh, here. So you have six, six numbers over there, six circuits here, and that's how you're gonna set priority. So just keep that in mind. And then if we go ahead and open up this compartment here, uh, we have your fuse, fuse panel here uh, for your uh, 12 volt appliances. And those are uh, marked there in terms of function on that sticker there. So uh, definitely my recommendation, pick up a variety pack of fuses, keep them with the unit. Uh, in the event that you have one of those burn out, uh, you have one to, to change. Uh, making sure I kind of hit everything and I think I have, we're going to step here into the restroom. Uh, if we uh, take a look up top, we again see that max fan that we've seen throughout the camper. Uh, you know, very standard RV style 
uh, shower. Uh, it does have an on off there on the head in the event to uh, conserve uh, all water consumption, but a specifically hot water consumption. Um, you're going to find yourself doing military Navy style showers, uh, cutting that water on and off throughout that shower to go ahead and conserve. Uh, that will allow you to do so without changing your mix here. Uh, we have an on off light switch there. Uh, very straightforward. Uh, porcelain bowl uh, is going to be a light press to fill up the toilet, full press to flush. So very easy to do so. Uh, make sure we're introducing our toilet chemicals from this location. If we're going to utilize a uh, deodorizer or a tissue dissolver, this is going to be uh, where they're introduced. Single ply toilet paper, things like that. All of that comes in effect with this unit. Uh, so making sure we are uh, taking care of that black water tank properly. Uh, I think that just about concludes it here with the interior of the Revolve. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to give us a call. We do hope you enjoyed this walkthrough. Uh, thank you very much for your time.